Hi, my name's Daniel Roy. I'm a professional sleight of hand magician, and today I'm going to teach you an easy magic trick. If you want to learn more sleight of hand magic like this, check out my online course, Card Magic 101. Link is in the description. As I spread through these cards, I just want you to take one out. Up to you which one. Great. Now I'm going to look away. I want you to look at your card, make sure you know what it is, and then turn it face down again. Great. And then why don't you just drop your card back into the deck for me? Now, watch closely. When I snap my fingers, one card in the deck turns face up. One card is now face up. Uh, the Joker. So was this your card? Did you pick the Joker? No. Oh, well, I mean, technically, I guess the Joker could represent any card in the deck. So in a manner of speaking, this is your card. Okay, well, you're probably not very impressed by that. Um, how about this? Would you be impressed if on the back of the Joker I had written the name of your card? I mean, that'd be pretty cool, right? Yeah. All right, well, you can see that indeed on the back of the Joker I have written the name of your card. Okay, once again, probably not very impressed. But what was the name of your card? You can tell me. Ace of Hearts. The Ace of Hearts. Well, I'm going to spell your card. A-C-E spells Ace. O F of H E A R T S hearts. Ace of hearts. And just by spelling your card, we have landed at the Ace of hearts. Now, for this effect, we need to set up a card in advance. So I've taken a Joker. Every deck of cards comes with a Joker. Um, and you're going to take the Joker uh, and you're going to write on the back. Now, it's really important in this case that the Joker has a red or light colored back because you want the writing to show up. And the problem is if you were to use a blue or black colored backed card, the writing wouldn't show up. Even if you used light colored ink, it just wouldn't show up. So you want to make sure you're using a red or light colored deck and that you write on the back with thick Sharpie. You'll notice that on the back of this card, I have written the phrase, the name of your card. Now to set up the trick, we need to position the Joker very carefully. So here's what you're gonna do. You need to go through the deck and take out four specific cards. The cards are the Ace of Clubs, the Two of Clubs, the uh, Six of Clubs, and the Ten of Clubs. And I'll explain why you need to use these cards in a moment. So the Ace of Clubs, Two of Clubs, Six of Clubs, Ten of Clubs, it doesn't matter what order they're in, you're just gonna turn them face down. And then you're gonna count seven cards on top of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, the order of this group of 11 cards, right, 4 plus 7, 11, uh, it doesn't actually matter what the order is. They can be in any order. Uh, they just happen to end up in the order with the ace, two, six, ten on the bottom because that's how he set it up. But it makes no difference what the order is. You just have a group of 11 cards that contains the ace, two, six, and ten of clubs, uh, and those go face down on the table. Then you take this joker with the writing on the back, and you put it face up on top. So we've got joker, 11 cards that contain the ace, two, six, and ten of clubs and then you're gonna drop the rest of the deck on top. So this is the setup. Whole deck of cards, Joker, 11 cards on the bottom that contain the ace, two, six, and 10 of clubs. And again, I'll explain why we chose those cards in just a moment. Okay, so now we're ready to start the trick. This is the secret setup. You do all of this before uh, the audience is aware. So you'd come out with a deck just in this configuration. They might even be in the box and you just take them out in this uh, configuration. Now it's important that when you hold the cards, uh, this is not uh, visible. And in order to make sure that that's the case, we need to properly learn how to hold a deck of cards. So we're going to start with the deck in what's called left hand dealing position. That means the cards are held in the left hand with three fingers on this side, the index finger at this side, and the thumb lies along this side here. Now you'll notice that the tips of the fingers are not way above the cards, nor are they way down here where the cards could spill out. Rather, there's just a little bit of the tips of the fingers above the cards. In terms of how tightly to hold the cards, hold them as if you were holding a bird. Tightly enough that the bird can't fly away, but not so tightly that you would crush the wings. That is one of my favorite metaphors, and it comes from card college. Now, in dealing position, the cards are held with some horizontal pressure between the fingers and the base of the thumb. Uh, and you'll see that there's some space under the cards. They're not all the way pressed down, nor are they all the way up here. So this is left-hand dealing position. Now, the next grip that we need to learn is what's called right-hand end grip. Here's how to get there. Take the left index finger, extend it under the deck, bring the right hand over the cards, and take the deck in end grip like this. So end grip means you've got the thumb at the back, three fingers at the front, index finger curled on top. And you're going to lift the deck up like this. 
Now you'll notice that these three fingers are not just at the edge of the deck. The fingertips protrude down below the deck like this. So some of the thumb is below the deck, some of these fingers are also below the deck. This is right hand end grip, and you'll notice the index finger is curled on top. Now when people often learn end grip, they hold the cards like this, and you need to make sure you rotate the hand down like so to keep those fingers uh, nicely together like this. Now we're going to put the cards back in left hand dealing position. Here's how you'll do it. You'll take those cards, and you're going to take this edge, and you will align them with the base of uh, the thumb like this. These three fingers come in, second, third, and fourth fingers of the left hand come into this side, index finger back at the front, and you're back in left hand dealing position with the cards held between the uh, thumb, heel of the thumb, these three fingers, and the index finger out at the front like so. And it's very important that when you put the cards back, they end up in the same position they started in. So when the cards are in dealing position, you take them in end grip, and when you put them back, they can't end up way out here or way back in here. They shouldn't end up way down here or up here. A nice, relaxed, even dealing position like so. Now, the first exercise to work on is to transfer the deck back and forth between uh, left hand dealing position and right hand end grip, which looks like this. You extend the left index finger under the deck. You take the cards in right hand end grip, and you pick them up. And then you put the cards back in left hand dealing position like so. And you're just going to go back and forth and back and forth. Notice I always extend this finger under the deck before I pick them up so it doesn't run into these fingers. Back and forth. This is the most important exercise that you'll ever learn with a deck of cards. Unfortunately, it's also the most boring, but I promise it will pay dividends later on, and you need to be able to do this to do this trick properly. So back and forth from dealing position to end grip. Now you want to practice this very, very slowly. So you start in dealing position, move the finger down, take the cards in end grip, lift them like so, make sure your end grip is totally correct. Place the cards back in dealing position like so. You start at this snail's pace as if your hands are submerged in a pot of honey, and then slowly speed up. And if you notice any bad habits creeping in, just go right back to that snail's pace again. So now that we know how to transfer the cards from hand to hand, we need to learn how to have someone pick a card. You're going to take the left thumb, and you're going to put it right at this left side of the deck, and you're going to push some cards over it like so, and take them in the fork of the right thumb. This is what we might call right thumb clamp grip. They're taken in the fork of the thumb, and they are just clamped down like so. And you're going to keep pushing over cards like this, and you will extend the fingers under the deck, which allows you to have a wide spread. If you didn't extend the fingers, they would fall, and that would be bad. So you're using the left thumb to push cards over. Now, the position of these three fingers is critical here, because if they're too high, no cards go over. If they're too low, they all go over. These fingers act as a gauge. They slightly extend as you push the cards over, and they further extend as you push more cards over, taking them into thumb clamp grip, extending the fingers under the spread like so. And now you let the audience member reach in and take a card. So they take a card out of the deck. And you'll notice that when people pick cards, sometimes they'll go hunting for a specific card. So as you spread through, you may need to slow down when they start nearing the deck and fan out the card so they can pick one. But that is, in essence, how to have someone pick a card. You start in dealing position, you push some cards over, take them into right thumb clamp, spread the cards out like this, they choose whichever card they want, and then all you're going to do is use the right hand to shove the cards back to the left, they land in dealing position, and you simply grip them in dealing position, which helps square the cards up, and then you're going to grip the cards in end grip, run the left fingers along the sides of the deck like this, put them back in dealing position, run the right fingers along the sides like this with the right thumb at the back, and this fully squares the cards. So you're going to have someone select a card. So just like we learned, you spread the cards out between your hands, someone chooses a card. Now, of course, you can't spread all the way down to the bottom of the deck because uh, they would see the joker. So just spread out like the top half of the deck or so and have someone choose a card. Go for someone who's not going to give you any trouble or try to you know, go hunting for a card near the bottom. Uh, you can usually get some sense for this uh, when you're having audience members help out. So just make sure it's someone who's not going to you know, go for a card near the bottom and try to give you a hard time. So spread through the deck. Uh, and again, if you are getting near the bottom, just square up the cards. Do it again. Spread out. Let them choose a card. So they take a card out, and you're going to look away, and you'll have them look at the card. So you look away. They show the card to everyone here. Now, of course, you wouldn't know what it is. It could be any card, in this case, the Ten of Diamonds. And then you have them turn it face down. You say, OK, is it face down? Good. Now you turn around. And you confirm that, because you wouldn't want to turn around uh, if the card is still face up, because then you would see it, and it would kind of ruin the effect. So. Here's what you do. You've got the cards in left hand dealing position. Whole deck, joker, 11 cards below it that contain the ace, two, six, and ten of clubs. 
you're going to cut off roughly a third of the deck. Doesn't have to be precise, just aim for about a third. Put them on the table. So when I say cut off a group of cards, that just means you take them in end grip. So you're not taking the whole deck in end grip, you're just reaching over and taking a third. So you pin the cards in place with the index finger, use the second finger and the thumb to lift up slightly. This picks up some cards, so you're not just hoping you get a third, but you're able to actively pick up on about a third of the deck, put those on the table. Then they take their selected card and you tell them to put it face down right here, and you drop the rest on top. Now you say, okay, I'm gonna try to make your card turn face up. Would that be impressive? And they'll say, sure. You snap your fingers and you pick up the deck and you spread the cards out between your hands. It's the same thing as spreading out the cards for a selection. You're just not gonna have them choose a card. So you spread through like this and, oh look, there's the Joker. And you say, one card is turned face up. Uh, was your card the Joker? And of course they'll say no. And you say, well, I mean, the Joker sort of could represent any card, kind of like in card games, right? The Joker could be any card. So technically this sort of is your card. And of course this won't be impressive or satisfying to them. So you're gonna take the cards in the right hand. You, you break the spread where the Joker is. Take the cards in your right hand, drop them on the table. We're not even gonna need these anymore. Now, you then say, okay, how about this? Would you be impressed if on the back of the Joker I'd written the name of your card? And they'll say, of course. So, for the first time, what was the name of your card? And they'll say it out loud, 10 of diamonds. And you say, look, on the back of the Joker, I have written the name of your card. And just make sure you turn the Joker over in such a way that the writing is right side up from their perspective. So I know that the writing is actually the opposite way from the way the Joker faces. So I know I have to turn it over end for end. But if you'd written it the same way the Joker was facing, you'd need to turn it over side for side. If that made no sense, just play around and you'll see exactly what I mean. So you turn it over and oh look, the name of your card. Now, of course, this is kind of funny. They are once again, not going to be impressed. Uh, it kind of seems at this point like you're just trying to get out of it over and over again, and you're not ever actually gonna get around to finding your card, but indeed you will. You might be wondering, why did we have exactly 11 cards right under the Joker? Well, every single card in the deck can be spelled to, where you deal one card for each letter in the name of the card with either 11 letters or 12 letters except for the ace, two, six, and 10 of clubs, which is why we put them in that 11 card group because they can't possibly select a card from that group. It's below the Joker, we're never gonna spread past the Joker, so they can never select a card from that group, which means they can never get the ace, two, six, or 10 of clubs. And the reason those cards don't work is because they spell with 10 letters when you spell out the whole name, A-C-E-O-F, C-L-U-B-S is 10 letters, and the six, the 10, and also the two are also three letter numbers, so they don't work. Um, and the reason it's clubs is because clubs is the shortest suit. It's only five letters, whereas hearts is six letters, spades is six letters, and diamonds is eight letters. That's why those cards are eliminated so that they can't uh, choose them. Now, in addition to memorizing the lengths of the suits, you also have to know the lengths of the values. So ace is three letters, two is three letters, three is five letters, four is four letters, five is four letters, six is three letters, seven is five letters, eight is also five letters, and then the nine is four letters, the 10 is three letters, and the jack is four letters, and the queen is five letters, and the king is four letters. That's like a tongue twister saying numbers and then the number of letters that they are. Now, in this case, it was the 10 of diamonds, and you need to do a little bit of thinking at this point to make sure that you spell correctly. Because when I say that every card in the deck spells with 11 or 12 letters, I don't mean that actually every card truly is 11 or 12 letters. I mean, you can make any card spell with 11 or 12 letters just by altering your script. I know that I need to either deal 11 cards, right? Because if I deal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, the next card I would reveal as their card. Or if I need to count 12 cards because it's a 12 letter name, I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then I reveal the last card I dealt as their card. Uh, you didn't claim that it would be the next card or the last card of the ones you dealt, so you can do either one and it just seems like that's what you meant to do. So the question then is, how do we make it so that either of these situations, 11 or 12, always arise? The answer is you just change the rules of how you're gonna spell out their cards. So 10 of diamonds. Okay, we know diamonds is eight letters, right? And we know 10 is three letters and we know of is two letters, right? So three letters, 10, plus two letters of plus eight letters, right? That's five and eight, that's 13, that's too many. So we can't spell 10 of diamonds, that's not gonna work. So you can say, okay, well, technically speaking, this isn't the name of your card. I mean, it literally says the name of your card, but it's not the name of your card. You can have some fun with this by play in the script if you want to. However, the name of your card will lead us to your card. So at this point, you say that you're going to spell the name of their card. So uh, the value was 10, right? kind of making it seem like you're only tentatively knowing what their card is. So, okay, so 10, so I'm gonna spell 10, T-E-N. So that's the value, 10. Now the suit was, it was diamonds, right? 
Okay, so I'm going to spell diamonds. D-I-A-M-O-N-D-S. Now, diamonds is eight letters. 10 is three letters. Eight plus three is 11, which means this is the 12th card. So this is the 10 of diamonds. So with just a little bit of thinking, you can make any card spell to this location in the deck. So let's take a few other examples so you can see how this would work. Now, of course, the card we're gonna land on every time is the 10 of diamonds, but let's imagine that it was a different card. Let's imagine that it was, say, uh, the seven of diamonds. The seven of diamonds, the three of diamonds, the queen of diamonds, these are uh, the longest names in the deck. And so here's what you do for those, uh, because uh, the, the, the suit is eight letters and the of is two letters and the value is five letters, right? Three is five letters and seven is five letters and queen is also five letters. So that's why these are the longest ones because it's the longest value and the longest suit. So if I spelled uh, queen of diamonds, Q-U-E-E-N, five letters, O-F, two letters, D-I-A-M-O-N-D-S, eight letters, right? That would be five plus two, which is seven, plus eight is 15. That's obviously not gonna work. That's not 11 or 12. Okay, what if we just eliminated the of? Okay, Q-U-E-E-N, that's five. D-I-A-M-O-N-D-S, that's eight. Five plus eight is 13. Uh, it's still too many. Well, here's the last trick that we have. We can take the S off of the suit just by changing the syntax of what we say. So I would say, let, let me get out the Queen of Diamonds just for uh, the sake of accuracy here. So the Queen of Diamonds, unless it has escaped me, is here. So at this point, uh, the Queen of Diamonds is 11th from the top. So three, six, nine, 10, 11. Well, it's not 11th, it's 12th from the top. But there are 11 cards on top of it. And of course, we're holding about half the deck at this point. So we've got three, six, nine, 10, 11, 12 is the Queen of Diamonds. So it's 12th from the top, 11 on top of it. So the correct way of phrasing this. Now. Here's what I would do. I'd say, okay, so I'm gonna spell your card. The value is queen. Q-U-E-E-N spells queen. And you, you do wanna say spells queen at the end or spells five or whatever the value is just so people are clear because they might not quite realize what Q-U-E-E-N spells unless you say it. Now that's the value. Now the suit, it was a diamond, right? So instead of saying the suit was diamonds, you say, now your card was a diamond, right? By saying A, it forces you to use the singular diamond rather than the plural diamonds. So this allows you to take the S off of the suit. And you say, okay, so it was a diamond, and so I'm going to spell a diamond. So that's D-I-A-M-O-N-D. Now, this was five, and diamond is seven, Five plus seven is 12, which means this is the queen of diamonds. So even though the full name is 15 letters and just the value in the suit are 13 letters, we used uh, syntax to make the suit one letter shorter, right? Diamond, which is seven letters instead of diamonds, which is eight letters. So that now we have spelled to the card uh, amazingly, uh, even though the name seems like it wouldn't be possible. So this is the longest card in the deck. Now, the shortest cards in the deck that would work, again, the ace, two, six, and 10 of clubs won't because that's 10 letters and there's just no way to add on that extra letter. So this might be, let's say the uh, four of clubs would be a great example. So let me find the four of clubs. Now the four of clubs is the shortest card that will work because the value four uh, is four letters and the suit clubs is five letters, which means we're gonna need the of here to get enough length. And then it's gonna also be the next card because four is four letters of is two letters, four plus two is six, and then clubs with the S is five letters. So that spells uh, up to 11 letters, which means uh, it's 12th from the top. So we'll uh, use the 12th uh, card as the one to reveal. So three, six, uh, nine, 11, 12, or 10, 11, 12, uh, and half the deck is over here. So I'd say, okay, what was the name of your card? Four clubs, the name of your card. Oh, well, okay, you're probably not very impressed, but the name of your card, that's actually how we're going to find it. So your card, it was the four of clubs, right? Okay, so I'm gonna spell the name of your card. F-O-U-R spells four. O-F spells of. C-L-U-B-S spells clubs. So the four of clubs, and we have arrived at the four of clubs. Now, of course, there are lots of things in between the shortest, the four of clubs, among others, uh, and the queen of diamonds, among others. And so just with a little thinking, you can figure out how to get to every single card. Your choices are, do you include the of or not? And do you include the final S on the suit or not? And there are some circumstances where you may need to do one or the other or neither or both. Uh, so just with a little thinking and a little bit of practice, just going through a few cards, you'll see exactly how you need to do this for every card. And you don't learn this trick by memorizing what you do for every single card in the deck. 
You just learn this trick by understanding the principles, and you do have to know the number of letters in each suit by heart. So clubs, five, hearts and spades, six, and diamonds is eight. So you can always subtract one from each of them by saying, oh, it was a diamond, it was a heart. So you can take off the S, uh, and you can always include the of in the middle or not. And it's just all about your phrasing and all about your syntax. And then of course you either reveal the last card you dealt or the next card. I've been dealing quickly during the explanations just to get through the uh, explanation so you can see what's happening without this dragging on too long. But in performance, you wanna deal slowly enough that people can see you're not doing anything suspicious. But the key is you need to have decided how you're gonna spell to the card before you give people instructions. It can't seem like you're figuring it out as you're going along because if that's the case, it kind of gives away the secret that you're spelling the card in a specific way to get there. It needs to seem like this is what you meant to do the whole time. So you need to seem very confident in what you say and you need to totally have it figured out how you're gonna spell to the card before you do. So let's run through the entire sequence one more time. You've got the joker here with uh, the name of your card written on the back. You've got a deck of cards and the way you set this up is as follows. You're gonna take out the two of clubs and the 10 of clubs and the uh, six of clubs and also the ace of clubs. And then uh, you're going to deal seven cards on top. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you've got a group of 11 cards here that contains the ace, six, 10, and two of clubs, although it doesn't have to be in any specific order. This joker goes face up on top. The rest of the deck goes on top. So here's your setup. Balance of deck, joker, three, six, nine, 10, 11 cards. You spread out the cards and you have someone choose one at random. So in this case happens to be the five of spades. But of course you wouldn't know that. As you're looking away, uh, they all look at the card and remember what it is. They turn it face down. You cut off a third of the deck. They put their card back face down and you drop the rest on top. Snap your fingers, claiming that you've made their card a turn face up and you ribbon spread the deck like so. And apparently drop the rest on top. Now pick up the deck and hold it in left hand dealing position. Snap your fingers and then spread the cards in between your hands, claiming that you've made their card turn face up. You say, okay, was it the Joker? And of course they'll say no. Uh, and as this is happening, you just take uh, all the cards above the Joker and drop them on the table. We won't need them anymore. And you say, oh, well, well, I guess technically the Joker could represent any card in the deck. And again, they won't be very impressed because that's not a good card trick. And you say, okay, how about this? Would you be impressed if the name of your card was written on the back of the Joker? And this would probably impress them. So you say, okay, what was the name of your card? They say what it is, in this case, the five of spades. And you say, look, on the back of this, I've written the name of your card. And of course, once again, they're not gonna be very impressed, although this is kind of funny in a grown sort of way. Now, you uh, put this card down on the table and you say, oh no, but really the name of your card, this is how we're going to find your card. So your card was the five of spades. So we are going to spell the name of your card and I'm going to deal one card for each letter and I'll deal slowly. So we'll start with the value, which is five. F-I-V-E spells five. O-F spells of, and then the suit was spades. S-P-A-D-E-S, -S, the five of spades, and lo and behold, we have arrived at the five of spades. So I hope you've enjoyed learning this trick. It really is a super strong effect. I think you'll get a lot of mileage out of it once you've practiced this. Just make sure that you're comfortable with the procedure and also make sure that you are comfortable uh, spelling all the different cards in the deck and making sure that you actually spell to them correctly and that you have confidence in what you say so it doesn't seem like you're making it up as you're going along. And that just comes from having a good sense of how to figure out uh, how to spell each card and making sure you do it in advance as they're marveling at this amazing joke. Uh, it's not so amazing, obviously. Uh, you have some mental free time to, to figure that out. So best of luck learning this trick and performing it. I hope you have a fun time doing it for all your friends. And if you like what you saw here today, check out my online course, Card Magic 101. Link is in the description. It's a comprehensive online course where I'm gonna teach you how to go from knowing nothing about sleight of hand to being a great card magician. But it's not just for beginners, it's also for advanced practitioners because I'm going to include all the details and nuances that I've learned from over 15 years of performing magic. Now this isn't just a static course with one set of videos. Rather, there's a core set of videos that's already uploaded and online for you to learn from as soon as you sign up. And I'm going to be adding new content to the course every single month. So let's talk about a typical month in Card Magic 101. On the first week, I will post a syllabus detailing what we're going to cover. 
on the second week, I will post a video about the practice, the mechanics of how to perform a technique or how to perform a trick. On the third week, I will post the theory. In other words, I'll answer the why questions behind that technique. What makes it deceptive? What makes it not deceptive? What are some situations you might use it in? How does it behave in the context of a routine? Or if I'm teaching a trick that month, I will provide some performance tips that will help you find your way of performing it. On the fourth week of each month, I will do an invite only live stream. It's only for people who are signed up for the course. And you'll be able to ask me questions about what we've covered that month or any other month. And I will answer those questions on video. I can demonstrate uh, what you might need to do to solve your problems. And of course, these live streams will be recorded, so they'll be posted to the course page and you can watch them on your own time whenever you like. Now for advanced practitioners out there, if some of the things in this course seem like you really already know them or they're too basic, well, it may not be for you. Luckily, I do teach private lessons to students of all levels and I can work with you at whatever level you're at. So you can contact me on my website, danielroymagic.com, if you're interested in taking private lessons. I'm super excited to have you here. I think this course will be a lot of fun. So welcome to Card Magic 101.